Looking to sound like you know what's going on in the world? Pop culture, social strategy, comedy, and other funny stuff? Well, join the club and settle in for the Jeff Dwoskin Show. It's not the podcast we deserve, but the podcast we all need with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Mark. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week is no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 41 of Live from Detroit, the Jeff Dwoskin Show. I'm your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Great to have you back for another week of fun. And fun we're going to have this week, I got to tell you. I got a special guest today, writer, director, producer, creator of V, The Bionic Woman, The Incredible Hulk TV series. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Kenneth Johnson is with us today. And we're talking Bigfoot, Bionic Woman, V, so much more. You're going to love it. And it's coming up in just a few minutes. And you know what else takes just a few minutes, folks? Interrupting a conversation you're having with a good friend, family member, boss, mentor, whomever it may be, and say, excuse me, boss, mentor, family member, whoever you may be. Have you taken the time to listen to Live from Detroit, the Jeff Dewaskin Show? It's an amazing pop culture podcast hosted by Jeff Dewaskin. I know you'll love it. And you should subscribe and listen to all the episodes today, right now. Stop what you're doing and go and do it. What? Oh, well, I mean, maybe after the surgery, doctor, sir. But then fully subscribe and commit to listening to Live from Detroit, the Jeff Dewaskin Show. You won't regret it. It's changed my life, and I'm sure it'll change yours. Change the script however you feel comfortable. Well, you know, that's the gist. You know, so if you do that, and make sure you're subscribed yourself. Make sure you sign up for my mailing list. You can go to my website, jeffisfunny.com, sign up for the mailing list. I also tweet a newsletter. You can sign up from there as well. I at Jeff Dwoskin Show on Twitter. And also, if you want to support the show, another small way you can do that is buymeacoffee.com slash Jeff Dwoskin Show. You can buy me a coffee. I'll drink the coffee. I'll think about you. You know, it's all good stuff. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for helping spread the love. I do appreciate it. However you do it, thank you. I also want to take the time to thank everyone for supporting the sponsors week after week. It means the world to me. It really does. And this week's sponsor is Bixby Jar Openers. Tired of not eating pickles because you can't open the jar? Are you stuck staring at pickles floating freely in jars? Tired of telling the kids pickles are pets that just don't need air? Can't shake the look your mother-in-law gives you that screams she wishes her daughter had married someone with the hidden strength that other suitors had? Well, no more. Big jars, small jars, really tight, kind of tight, no problem, no more. Introducing Bixby Jar Openers. You'll be guaranteed an open jar every time. With their patent-pending insults, Bixby jar openers will make you just angry enough to be the hero your family needs. You no longer need to be a physician or scientist to enjoy pickles at lunch or dinner or breakfast. Your family might not like you when you're angry, but they'll love you when you hand them that pickle. If you haven't eaten pickles in years, you need a Bixby jar opener. Available wherever pickles are sold. All right. Well, that's cool. Uh, Definitely check one of those out. I've had problems throughout the years and I bought one of those and we've been able to enjoy pickles and other things in jars now for years. So I definitely recommend a Bixby jar opener. And thanks again for supporting the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, that's how we keep the lights on here at Live from Detroit, the Jeff Dewaskin Show. And if you are just stopping by, if you saw Kenneth Johnson's The Guest this week, oh my gosh, I got to check that out. Make sure you check out past episodes also. Last week with comedian Alonzo Bowden, episode 40. Recently, we had Depressed Darth on. If you love Star Wars humor, check out Depressed Darth on Twitter and Instagram. Of course, we had the lovely Candy Clark from American Graffiti recently on the show as well, sharing amazing stories from American Graffiti and The Man Who Fell to Earth with David Bowie. But this week, I'm excited to talk to Kenneth Johnson. As a child of the 80s, V, the miniseries, had a huge impact on me. I was obsessed with V, love it to this day. So when I got to talk to the creator of V, it was very special, and I'm excited to share this conversation with you. Ladies and gentlemen, here's my chat with Kenny Johnson. All right. I am excited to welcome to the show, writer, producer, director, creator of so many iconic characters and shows, including the Bionic Woman, the beloved Incredible Hulk TV show, and of course, V. Welcome to the show, Kenny Johnson. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a delight to be here, and uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to 
have any questions about. It's a delight to have you here. I'm excited. I was I was going through, I always thought of this show as sort of my Comic-Con dream come true, right? To be able to talk to all these great people. And as I was kind of going through pairing, I realized like, oh, I've gone out of my way at Comic-Cons to meet Lindsay Wagner, the Bionic Woman. Right. I've got my picture with Lou Ferrigno, the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> and I do want to kind of dive into V. I rewatched the entire series. I forgot how into 80s action star Mark Singer I was. <laughs> <laughs> I met him and at a comic con too and had a photo with him. So I realized like I have a lot of your full collections. <laughs> the, the the Kenny Johnson collection, not available at any store. The, yeah, I've got a, I've got a great photo when we they did the uh the first bionic woman convention, the bionic con, I think it was in 2006 in Florida. And uh, and I hadn't seen much of Lindsay in the last 25, 30 years. They asked if I'd come in and um, uh, and we had a wonderful sort of reunion. And also they surprised me by bringing in Louis uh, Ferrigno and, and Mark Singer. It was sort of the, the Kenny Johnson <laughs> Memorial Con and got a great photo with the four of us together. It, it's really startling to see. And, and each one of them brings back such great memories of times that we had and the fun that we had uh, at Universal um, uh, and then later with Mark at Warner Brothers. It's funny, I always looked at my uh, jump starting at Universal as kind of like graduate school with pay because it was really kind of on the job training. And I wasn't interested in TV much to begin with, but Harv Bennett convinced me that he did listen. He offered me a job where I could be the producer and he informed me that the uh, the producer hired the writer and the director. And that was a, an opportunity I could not resist. My whole time there, though, was learning. And Harv always used to say, you know, Kenny, doing one hour episodic television is the greatest training in the world for making movies or for waging war. <laughs> and Because uh, if you can get through that and do it and do it well and with any level of quality at the same time, he said it's just a great place to learn. So it really was like grad school uh, with Pei, Jeff. I had not gone to any film school prior. I was uh, in the drama department at what is now Carnegie Mellon University and was then Carnegie Tech, uh, the drama department, which was the premier drama school in the in the country. But it was a theater school. There was no film or goodness knows, no television. They looked down their nose at that. Uh, I had this great theatrical training uh, before I uh, had come out, but I hadn't had any really film school training except what I had managed to pick up in college uh, by running a film society for four years. And it was a, a good dual education. You look in the mirror and you you created, like if anyone created just one of the things you created, they'd be like, <laughs> hey, they, hey, I'm pretty good. Look what I did. I I made just the bionic woman. Yeah, it's a, you put on your pants, you create the bionic woman, the Hulk show V so much more. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. it's interesting because so often... Uh, uh, if you you really count yourself very lucky in this business, if you are able to create one project that becomes truly iconic, like the Bionic Woman did, I always was interested from the time I was in about uh, ninth grade in theater. When I was uh, when I was in ninth grade, I had saved up my money and bought a tape recorder. A reel to reel, you know, it weighed about seven thousand pounds and was the size of a suitcase, right? And I was, you know, doing the stuff that you do what kids do, you're listening to your voice and playing back and all of that. And at the same time, I was reading uh, an anthology of, of shorter science fiction works, and one of them was the script that Howard Koch had written for Orson Welles called The War of the Worlds. And it was the the script that Wells had done on the radio at CBS in 1939 and scared the bejesus out of the country because they thought he made it sound like it was a real invasion happening now. And I said, this is cool. And I got a bunch of my ninth grade friends together and my tape recorder, and we made our version of the Wells broadcast. I, of course, reserved the role of Orson Wells for myself, put it together and just sort of directed it with my other friends and uh, we added the music. Anyway, it was a whole hour long show on tape and I played it for one of my teachers in high school who said, this is really cool. And she let me play it for one class and then a bunch of other classes wanted to hear it. And so pretty soon I became known as the drama guy. And I, and I sort of fell into it and I didn't realize it at the time, but I was really functioning sort of like a producer director, even at that early age. And in the next year, when I was a sophomore, they asked me if I would play the role of Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, which was going to be the Christmas production that year at the, at the high school. 
And I said yes, and I and I took on the role, and it was the standard version of the the story by Dickens. But it just sort of laid there at the end. It didn't have a really nice ending to it. So I did some digging, and I turned up an old recording. I think it was of Noel Coward reading it, uh, the story. And at the end, he did this wonderful little short 30, 40 second summation that sort of brought the whole piece together. And I asked the drama coach, I said, look, could, at, at the end of our play, can I just sort of step out in front of the curtains as Scrooge and just do this last piece? And I show, he said, oh, that's great. And then I thought, it needs music. It needs some music. So the choral department, 60 voices of our chorus, terrific chorus, was going to be singing. So I went to the choral coach and I said, what music are you going to be doing? And they showed me some of the Christmas carols and stuff. And I said, okay, how about this one? You do Oh Holy Night, and when the curtains close, you start going how they should start singing, but not the words. Just do, 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 do. And I'll step out on the stage, and I'll do my little speech, and then you have them sing out when they get to this point in the music. We do the play, the curtain closes, I step out onto the, onto the stage of the old gymnasium, which we where we'd had, and I had this one blue spotlight on me, and it was snowing outside, swear to God, yeah. They, their course, they're going, do, 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 start doing my, my, my little speech. Well, that was a Christmas for you. And I may tell you that Tiny Tim did not die. He's alive and growing stronger day by day. If I, now... Every Christmas when I'm in an elevator and Ho Holy Night starts, I start doing my Scrooge. And I timed it so that just as I got to the end, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. And at that point, the whole 60-voice chorus, full-voiced sings, fall on your knees, oh, hear the It was electrifying, Jeff. And I was standing backstage, and my little heart was going pity pat. And I said, I have to be in the theater. And that's when I decided in 10th grade, that was what it was. And so I was focused on that through uh, junior and senior high uh, years where I played the lead in the, in the senior and junior class plays and then got luckily auditioned for and got into Carnegie. And I noted in the Carnegie catalog that you could specialize in, in directing, writing, lighting design, costume design, production design. But if you were in the directing major, you had to take everybody's classes. And I decided to do that because I didn't know where I was going to end up. But again, as you can see, by putting together that little Christmas thing, finding the speed, the speech, and then adding the music to it, and then, you know, it was already I was producing and directing. So I guess it was meant to be. I just never looked back. You know, been very lucky. Ultimately, and quickly decided that I really wanted to focus on film, uh, which was frustrating at Carnegie because there was no film equipment. In my freshman year, I was befriended by a guy who was a senior. I met him my first week as a freshman. He was a senior, and he ran this thing called the Film Arts Society, where he showed a classic movie three different uh, screening times on Thursday afternoons. And for, I think it was three bucks, he got 14 movies each semester, right? And I helped him sell tickets. And when he was graduating, I said, who's going to take over the film society? And he, and he said, I thought you were. And I said, I don't know enough about film, Bill, what are you crazy? And anyway, I did end up taking it over. And so through my uh, sophomore, junior and senior years, I was running the film society and I was getting this sort of cinematech training. But I'd always been a movie fan, Jeff. What Bill introduced me, his name was Bill Pence. What Bill introduced me was the cinema. And I saw foreign films that I had never even heard of and silent films that I'd never known existed from all over the world. And so by the time I had gotten out of Carnegie, I had not only the, the Stanislavski theater training from the drama department, but I'd seen all of the same movies that Truffaut and Godard were seeing in the Paris Cinematheque. And I realized that, uh, that I really wanted to be in film. You know, that's how it all sort of developed from the beginning into producing, directing, and TV. Awesome. Let me ask you a question. The $6 million man, before you moved on to create The Bionic Woman, you worked on The $6 million man. From my memories, <laughs> one of the things that, that goes hand in hand with remembering The $6 million man is remembering Bigfoot. Bigfoot, right. <laughs> I still have his, um, I'll send you a photo of it. I, uh, in my office here, I have the ceramic cast of Andre the Giant's foot that we used there. We used it in the uh, in the Bigfoot episode. We also used it when I did the Incredible Hulk. I said, oh, I can use this again. It sits down on the floor of my office uh, downstairs here. Bigfoot was in everybody's consciousness in, in 1976, or, or I think it was when I wrote it. And I knew it was something that would, that would grab an audience and, and it just sort of fell together. I was answering fan letters just the other day. That's it's one of the things that comes up a lot in the fan mail. But when you go back and look at it, I, you know, I, in, in the DVD uh, release, I actually did a commentary on it. I had not directed it. There was so much in, interest in it that I went back and, and we went through it. And I got to meet Andre when, uh, when he, before he even spoke English and could uh, say his 
just naming uh, anything but French. And it was a very, very sweet guy. And I was so happy to see him turn up in The Princess Bride. I mean, the perfect casting, right? No better casting than that. The way I got into The Six Million Dollar Man was because of The Bionic Woman. When I first came, I had had some success back in, in New York and uh, live television and, uh, and music shows and stuff in, in New York. When I was just 22 years old, I was producing and directing in, at CBS and at WPIX in New York. I was asked by Westinghouse Broadcasting to join the Mike Douglas show uh, in 1966. The Douglas show was the first daytime talk show for people who are your age and don't even remember it. Westinghouse realized that there was an opportunity in daytime television to do a, a show like Johnny Carson or something, a, a talk variety music comedy show in the daytime. And it had started in Cleveland as a local show where they just sort of, they were like out of town tryouts, you know, how then Broadway shows will try out in Boston or someplace. Well, they tried out the Douglas show in Cleveland for like a year and a half and then began to move it into syndication. I worked on it as an intern while I was still in college at Westinghouse. And they even offered me a job when I graduated, but I said, no, I want to go to New York and make movies, which was a mistake because I got to New York and they said, why did you come to New York? We're not making any movies here, or that many anyway. But after a couple of years success in New York, I was invited to join the Mike Douglas show, which had then blossomed into about 150 stations and was the major, the only daytime talk show in the country. Oprah, of course, had a huge audience. The Mike Douglas show audience was 10 times the size of Oprah's. We had 80 to 90 million people tuning in every week. And everybody in the world came through there. And uh, I didn't want to do it, but the guy who was he had just been hired as a young executive producer on the show uh, told me he'd let me do a lot of film, which is what I wanted to do. And he seduced me. He was very good at seducing things. His name was Roger Ailes who later became, of course, the head of Fox News that he created and all of that. When I worked with Roger, I did not see him um, get involved in any untoward things. Uh, the only person I ever saw Roger hit on was Richard Nixon, whom he talked into hiring him when Nixon was running for president. And Roger said, told him he could get Nixon elected and Nixon believed him. And Nixon was right. And that was the beginning of what became Roger and uh, all other kinds of stuff. But I'd been back at the Douglas show. Uh, and when he left, I took over as executive producer. I was 25 years old. And I was, the, I guess, the youngest executive producer in the industry at the time. And it was a humongous show. But not what I wanted to do, Jeff. I really wanted to make film. So I finally, just after a season, uh, gave it up and, and came to the West Coast. And my friend Stephen Bochco, who had been with me at Carnegie in the drama department, Steve had made it out to the coast before I had and had gotten his foot in the door at Universal Studios, where he was just a fledgling writer. This was long before Steve created uh, Hill Street Blues and LAPD Law and NYPD Blue and uh, all, all of the others that he did. He was just a young writer at Universal. He said, listen, Kenny, I know you want to direct and be a director, but if you write, you can control your own destiny more. And because actors can do bit parts and work their way up. And writers can write on spec and hope somebody buys the script. But if you're a director, they either give you the money to do it or they don't. And I said, but Steve, I'm not a writer. I don't know how to do that. I'm not, I was terrible at it when we were in college. But he convinced me to take a crack at it and it really dragged me kicking and screaming into writing. And I discovered actually that I could do it better than I thought. I became a great writer, Jeff, of unproduced screenplays most of which are still sitting on my shelf today. And one of them was a, a, a very strong comedy uh, called The Stuntman about a fledgling stuntman. Burt Reynolds almost bought it. It was He had just made a deal for something else and we were disappointed. But Steve gave the script to Harv Bennett, who was a big executive producer at Universal, who was, had done Rich Man, Poor Man and a lot of miniseries and that sort of thing. Steve introduced me and Harv and I hit it off. And Harv was also producing The Six Million Dollar Man which was in its coming into its first full season. It had been a mid-season replacement, and now they were starting their first full season, and they had no scripts, and they were desperate to get going. And he asked me to bring him some ideas, and the first one that I brought him was, uh, well, I said, why don't we do The Bride of Frankenstein? Because, you know, you've got this guy with these weird legs and arm, and shouldn't he have a mate? Harv loved the idea, and so did Frank Price, who was running Universal. And they said, yeah, go and do it. And I created the uh, the character of Jamie Summers and wrote the script for The Bionic Woman. When I was finished, they called me and said, look, we really like the script, but it's too dense. And I said, I told you it was. I told you you were trying to have me do too much. It's a love story. It's got to be personal. He said, yeah, yeah, no, I know. Well, I said, well, what do you want me to cut? And they said, no, we don't want you to cut anything. We want you to make it longer. I said, whoa, 
really? Do I get paid twice? <laughs> and they said, <laughs> you do. I said, okay, I'm in. So I stretched it out and created the two-parter that became The Bionic Woman. And uh, Harv sort of took me under his wing because he saw that I had some producing chops as well as writing and knew that I wanted to be a director and do more and do more film. And it was Harv that, as I said, convinced me to take the job because the producer got to hire the writer and the director. So there I was producing Six Mill. By then, The Bionic Woman was just going on the air as the episodes of Six Mill and it took the ratings really high up. Uh, and suddenly the $6 million man was on everybody's lips. And then very quickly after that, they decided to spin it off and ask me to create a spinoff show. Being executive producer of a one-hour episodic television show, Jeff, is like living in a garbage disposal. Particularly if you're a guy that is doesn't think of himself as a writer, like Cannell did. Steve Butchko introduced me to Steve Cannell, who was also a young writer at Universal at the time. He had just, I remember when he gave me the script for a new pilot that he had written called The Rockford files and uh, just sort of kicking off at the same time was we, the, we were sort of the class of 1980 at Universal Studios how we think of ourselves Steve Cannell had given he managed to give me a couple of directing assignments and writing assignments before Harv but it was really Harv that uh, took me under his wing and said okay take it and run with it kid and I did and for a while I was writing and producing both series at the same time and there are some guys in this town, men and women, who love that. And to me, it was like, no, it's not what I want to do. Because when you're executive producing one show, much less two, you don't have any time to direct. Because directing means you're on, you know, you're prepping for seven or eight days, and then you're shooting for seven or eight days, and then you're doing post after that. And when you're executive producer, you got to do that 22 times over simultaneously, and uh, while you're juggling 12 balls and a mop, it was tough. So I spun it off from uh, six mil, but I had a lot of fun with Lee Majors. I saw him, incidentally, last year for the first time in a long time. The Hollywood Museum uh, down on Vine Street was opening a bionic exhibit, bionic woman and six mil, and they asked me to come down and sort of cut the ribbon and be there with Lee. And I hadn't seen him in, God, 25, 30 years. And he was still the same guy that I knew back in the, in the day. He was this Oklahoma boy who just, you know, come on, hey, how you doing, Kenny? <laughs> you know, and uh, he sounded the same. He had the same sense of humor. He looked terrific still. And we had a great afternoon together, just laughing and remembering the Bigfoot stuff. But when we did Bigfoot, there's this scene where in the ice tunnel, I wrote the script where Sasquatch is carrying the unconscious Lee through this ice, the rotating ice tunnel. And my production manager said, what are you talking about? This is a one hour episode television show. We can't build rotating ice tunnels. What are you nuts? And I said, Teddy, can, let me take you for a ride onto the back lot. And I took him right into this thing on the Universal Tour where the uh, trams drove through this ice tunnel that rotated and it threw your equilibrium off and it was crazy. And he said, oh, we can use this? And I said, yes, Teddy, and it's free. Oh, okay, that's cool. The problem was trying to film in it, Jeff, because we'd get set up and get ready for a shot and then we'd start the tunnel rotating and everybody on the crew would fall over. And I'm, I don't exaggerate. It really does. I said, all right, I know how we can solve this. Open the door at the end so you can see the horizon. If you can see the horizon, you won't fall over. Wrong. <laughs> you know, the effect of that rotation around you to your peripheral vision just totally screwed with your head. And everybody was falling over. And, and uh, Andre had to carry Lee right down the middle of the pipe, you know. And Lee said, to, he said took me aside and said, Kenny, he's going to drop me on my ass. He can't do that. He can't even stand up in here, man. He come on, he's got, and he weighs three hundred and fifty pounds. He's gonna kill me, man. I said, Lee, I told him the secret of how to do it because I had told, showed Andre that if you look down and not out, if you look straight down at the floor as you're walking, you can walk a straight line. As soon as you look up, it was all over. That may be in the DVD commentary that I did on the uh, on the Bigfoot episode. It was a funny day of trying to film, that's for sure. That is an awesome story. It's so cool to hear how those evolved. <laughs> yeah, that was great. So I do want to, I want to cover V. I want to talk about V. V was like one of those miniseries that I saw. I watched it with my dad. I hadn't seen it in a long time and I actually, I just rewatched it. Mm -hmm. I, it was funny how I remembered all the beats. I mean, it filled in a little bit, you know, cause it's been 37 years. It's great. And I think it's considered, I think one, by many people to be one of the greatest TV miniseries ever. And, and it is, it really is. There's some interesting aspects to it too. It's the, uh, still to this day, the only miniseries 
that was made without any movie stars in it or even really any TV stars. I mean, Mark had had some notoriety from Beastmaster, but, you know, it wasn't really what you'd call like Bill Bixby in terms of notoriety, you know, on the Hulk. And I asked Brandon Tartikoff, who was then president of NBC at the time about that. I said, you sure you don't want to put any stars? And he said, no, we don't need any. It's the, it's the concept and the way you've executed it that's going to work. And so he was convinced of that. And to this day, it is, uh, I am told, we had a 40 share, which uh, was in North America alone was like 80 or 90 million people tuned in. And then when it was went overseas the following year, it outrated the rating of the uh, Olympics in 84 around the world, like two to one. And it is, somebody pointed out to me recently, the highest rated work of science fiction in television history, which is pretty amazing. It was a challenge, that's for sure. And while they may not have been famous at the time, Robert England was in it. He went on to become Freddy in Nightmare on Elm Street. As I watch it now, I feel like a lot of those actors went on to do a lot afterwards. No question. And there's a very funny skit that you can find online. It was a show that, a comedy show that Bob did, uh, Bob England did, where uh, he was trying to take a girl back to his apartment and impress her with his freddiness. And she kept saying, yeah, but tell me about Willie and V. And Robert made a really funny uh, piece out of it on, in this video piece. I'm not sure it's on my website, but it's you can find it, you know, Robert England as Willie in YouTube. And it's really, really funny. And he was wonderful uh, and, and just exactly the guy that I wanted. He told me when he was out doing public appearances for Freddy versus Jason a few years ago, they'd have these press conferences and all that anybody wanted to ask him about was V. It was really f- freaking out the, the people who wanted to publicize their movie. And at one of the press conferences, they said, look, does anybody have a question that's not about V? And all the hands came down. And Robert just really had a belly laugh out of it. Oh, that's so funny. That is so funny. He was so good in it and so different, so different. Hey, well, here's what's funny. Like I'm sitting there watching it and I'm kind of, you know, just really tuned into it. And I'm thinking to myself, now keep in mind, just anyone listening, this was written in, on TV in 1983. So 37 years ago. Had you written this today and put this out, this exact movie today? Yeah. And then people would have been like, uh, Kenny... Yeah, a little too on the nose with your Donald <laughs> Trump parallel political stuff. We get it. But, you know, this is a little too... On the nose, we say, yes. Yeah. If you go to my, my website, which is just kennethjohnson.us, there's some very, very telling artwork where we see the visitor leader as Donald Trump. There's an artist that did a whole billboard size graffiti work in France last year, a year and a half ago, with the same thing, with uh, we're here to be your friends. And as a matter of fact, on the billboard, he even put to the heroism of the resistance fighters past, present and future. This work is respectfully dedicated, which was the title card that I put, as you know, at the beginning right. of the beat. And when I saw it, it was all in French. I did the translation. I went, oh, my God. No, you're right. And as a matter of fact, we we're in endeavoring. I, I discovered in the last about a few years back that I own and control the motion picture rights to V. And we have been uh, endeavoring to set it up uh, as, a, as a movie, as a, the first of a movie trilogy, with the two sequels being drawn from my novel, V, The Second Generation. When the news first came out, I had a lot of new best friends, Jeff. You know, all the studios were calling, hey, Kenny, love to, you know, came offering really just a, obscenely large amounts of money to buy the rights. But I had concerns about sort of getting sidelined. Uh, I know what happens with studios very often. So I said no. And you know what happens when you say no in Hollywood, Jeff? They go, yeah, yeah. Okay, we understand. How much money do you really want? You know, and I'm saying no, guys. You, you don't get it. It's about protecting my baby. Because I had seen people try to remake, reimagine the Bionic Woman and reimagine the Incredible Hulk. The first two movies that they made were just terrifyingly awful. And I didn't want that to happen to me. And I decided my wife, Susie, really put it into focus for me when she said, would you prefer that the movie never got made than see it get made wrong by the wrong people? And I decided, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. So we are have been in our in the midst in, in the midst of trying to set up the uh, the trilogy uh, at this point as uh, as a remake of the original miniseries. Follow it on to its conclusion in uh, uh, the second generation, which picks up the story 20 years after the visitors first arrived. It's a very strong piece, and we've had it set up a couple of times, and then had it fall apart because there was no ink in the pen when they sat down to write the check. Um, but uh, we're hopeful it'll it'll still happen, and I'm glad you feel that it's. It's still timely. It, to me, it's always been like Spartacus and the revolt of the slaves or the American Revolution or apartheid or uh, uh, any of those stories where 
an oppressed people are fighting back against a, an uber powerful uh, opposition. Something that I think really bears retelling. And, uh, and certainly there are fans out there all over the world that have been uh, champing at the bit to be able to see it. The story itself, which obviously paralleled the Holocaust and the Nazis taking over and the imagery of the the visitor suits and their the altered swastika, the A. Bernstein character who was in the Holocaust, who was reminding people and saying, you know, you have to, you have to be careful. You can't let these things happen. You have to be aware of what's happening. Right. His constant thread throughout. But it, what's interesting as I was watching this is you have the big, the big lie. Big lie. That's exactly right. It's the big lie. Yes. You have the, you have the big lie. You know, hey, we're here to help you. We're going to give you stuff. We're going to make your lives better. Right. And then uh, then they turn on science. If anyone listening, yes. this, this was written in 1983, okay? So they turn on science and they make science the enemy. Science is against all of us. As a matter of fact, they could have cured cancer, but they held back. They were trying to get money. They're against you. The scientists are against you. So in V... The scientists are kind of like the Jews where like they were kind of just shoved out exactly. and made into vermin. Then you get people believing the lies and then they turn on the media. Oh, we have to remove the media. Fake news. What you're seeing on this TV by these people, this isn't real. This isn't right. We're good. We're helping you. Everything you think you see, even though you're seeing it, you're not seeing it. <laughs> That's right. And then you have, then we have had last in the last few years, uh, a president who is standing up and saying, don't believe what you see and hear. Literally those words, you know, and I can't tell you how many times people have commented to me about that in the last four years uh, and, and how many times that my inspiration uh, initially for it was having read, I was a big fan of Sinclair Lewis, who wrote Elmer Gantry and Aerosmith and a lot of wonderful novels. But in 1935, he had written It Can't Happen Here, which was about, as you know, the, the rise of uh, fascism in America happening like it was happening in Germany and Italy with the idea of, well, this is America, it can't happen here. And good God, man, it's exactly what we have been living through for the last four years, including the, the, the use of the media, which was something that was a lot of the reviewers commented on at the time when V first came out about the way that the media was woven through the entire piece. It, it's really key because in order to take that kind of control, you have to control what people are seeing and hearing. You have to control the, uh, the communications. And if you can control the communications, even in this day and age, suddenly you can have a, an enormous amount of very, very dangerous power. Oh, yeah. And then martial law became the thing. The visitors, with the help of the government, right. institutes martial law in V. Right. Again, everyone, this is 19. For the, for the protection, for our protection, you know, right. Propaganda everywhere. The visitors are our friends. Right. Friendship is universal. So the truth becomes the enemy, which is exactly what we've been living through. Exactly. Media becomes one-sided. You have only one side of the media being presented. And then families, which is interesting, because I remember watching at the time when Donovan's mom turns them in and they, they all split. But that became everyone's family in the last four years. Right, yes. This hatred and this these lies and the manipulation of the truth literally split families in half, right? It's Abe, you know, who changes V for visitors to victory to kind of turn that rebel on. If you are going to do it, do it right. Exactly. Leonardo Cimino, bless his sweet soul. He uh he absolutely captured what I was what I was looking for and what I uh, you know what I wanted to accomplish in the uh, in the piece and some things don't change in, in the new movie that we are planning it uh, it has been updated to uh, an interesting degree and uh, but I can't talk too much about it yet <laughs> sure sure I just wanted to also kind of point out that you had there's a scene where, and I had to stop it and write this down, where Donovan asks Martin, who's a leader of the fifth column, who's the, the visitor aliens who are against what the visitors are doing. And they're talking about how Martin's talking about his leader and how the leader took over. And this is under his command. And Donovan says, well, how could you have a leader like that? And the answer is <laughs> charisma, circumstances, and promises. And then no one spoke up until it was too late. I wrote that down because I was like, that was one of the things where I was like, if Kenny had written this right now, people would be like, come on, Kenny, we get it. You don't like Donald Trump. <laughs> it's like, this was 1983. I mean, like the, the patterns, it kind of speaks to why this story is so universal and timeless 
because we don't learn the lessons that we need to learn. And we do have to be, you know, I go to you in religious school, you're retaught the Holocaust. So you don't forget that it happened. Right. Of course. And these these stories are so important because we do have to look ourselves in the face and and kind of realize after everything that just happened and insurgents on the Capitol and these things can happen, they can. And then the interesting thing when Donovan's mom says, why is she doing it? Well, they're power. They're in power. They are power. That's right. They, and, and you have to take it in taking advantage and survive at the expense of other people is what these uh, people do when they want to be at the top of the echelon. Yeah, that's and that's what I was most interested in doing was should, it was taking a, a group of everyday ordinary people. Uh, you know, there were no presidents and generals and fighter pilots and uh, all of that sort of stuff in V. There, as as you know, they they were ordinary people like you and me living in an ordinary neighborhood. And and I wanted to show how when the way that people react to power. V was never about aliens and science fiction stuff and reptilian races and all. There were no aliens or any of that stuff in the original screenplay at all. I had intended it to be a grassroots fascist takeover uh, story, <laughs> very much like what's happened in the country lately. And Brandon Tartikoff was concerned that they that people wouldn't get fascism as well as they would if it was like the Chinese or the Russians or somebody. And I didn't believe they could sustain uh, that kind of an occupation of the U.S. And then Jeff Sagansky, who was Brandon's vice president at the time, later went on to run CBS and TriStar and Sony and a lot of other things and a big, great friend. Jeff said, how about aliens, Kenny? And I said, you know, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I've done the, you know, you create the bionic woman and then you create the incredible health for series television. And then, you know, I, 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 I was very aware that in this town, the pigeonhole gets smaller and smaller. And like I did War of the Worlds in high school and got labeled the drama guy, right now I was looking like being labeled like the sci-fi guy. And I didn't want to uh, have that kind of a career. I wanted to have one that was much more broad and fully versed. And fortunately, I did get to do a lot of other things too. But, uh, certainly the things that I've become the most well-known for are pieces that have involved what I have always called sort of speculative fiction, or one step beyond reality. And the beauty of working in that kind of a genre, Jeff, is that you're working in metaphor. And sometimes the metaphor comes amazingly close to the real world, which we saw, have seen happen in V recently. And that's why we are so eager to do the new version of it, which will not be a reimagining. My intent is to do a really very faithful remake of the original, although it's I'm bringing up the uh, the Holocaust situation by a couple of generations by using a different backstory for the uh, the families that was the Bernsteins. It's a story that bears telling how everyday people react to power, how some will suck up to it like the Vichy French did in World War II. Others will try to just keep their head down. Well, I'm not Jewish. I'm not a scientist. Then they won't come after me if I don't bother them. Or the people who are the people that say, no, 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 no. This power is being abused and we have to fight back against it with our lives if we have to. And they, of course, are the ones that become the heroes of the resistance. And and that story doesn't go away. You know, it really doesn't. As I was kind of researching this and I realized there was that book that you wrote. You know, it's one thing like as a little boy watching V and then V, the final battle. And then just now going back and rewatching it as a boy, I was like, woohoo. But right now watching it, V the Final Battle, I was so happy to find out you wrote a book, clearly is not what. No. Because I learned that you didn't actually, well, uh, someone named Lillian Weezer. <laughs> wink, wink. Lillian Weezer was my golden retriever at the time. <laughs> That's great. But she has her own IMDb page, which is exciting. That is. Yeah. So I was, I was excited because I was like, because the end of V is very, they're looking, they're trying to get the, um, the enemies of their enemy to come save right, them. Right, exactly. And, and that entire thing gets completely thrown away. I can't imagine that Elizabeth, the alien baby, would have been as mystical. No, I, I, you know what? I, I, I spent the summer of 1983 with three brilliantly talented writers, uh, Diane Froloff, Peggy Goldman, and Craig Buck, who helped me to conceive and write the story for what we were at the time calling The Conclusion. It later became known as the final bugger, a uh, final battle. And but we, Warner Brothers and I, had a falling out at the end of that summer, and and I left the studio because I would. They were not honoring my contract. They had breached the contract uh, in really ugly dis ways, and it got handed off to other people who really didn't get it. And Brandon was, I heard, furious when he saw the changes that they had made on the script. But by then, they were too deep in, and they couldn't back away. And all of my friends who worked on it, both crew and cast members, told me, "Don't ever watch it, Kenny, because it, it, you won't be able to." You know. So I, I, I took their advice, and I never watched it. And uh, 
I don't know, maybe you've heard me tell this quick story, was I, uh, the only time I ever saw 30 seconds of it by accident once, Jeff, I was turning channels. I said, wait a minute, what's that? And I realized, oh, it's a scene from the sequel, The Final Battle. And I watched it for 30 seconds and turned it off because I watched them make every mistake they could possibly make in 30 seconds. My friends were right. I would never survive seeing the whole thing. Fortunately, the uh, it did very well in the ratings, not as well as our original V, but uh, it obviously still did a big number. But the reviews <laughs> were not as kind, and uh, particularly when they compared it to what we had set out to do and the quality that we had invested into into the original. And some of them made reference to the fact that part of the reason for that was because I was not there. So I got some of my best reviews <laughs> backhandedly. <laughs> uh, in, in the sequels that we're doing, the, the final battle does not come into, uh, it's free, it never existed. And we go from uh, the message having been sent out along with the first alien baby being born, first of the hybrids. And then we pick up the story 20 years later and we see what's become of the world. And it's not a dystopia. It's not so bad, really. On the surface, particularly, it's really good on the surface. Yeah, some people, yes, the scientists live in their own nice communities because we need to protect them. The, the war babies who are part human and part uh, alien are now referred to by both of the pure species as the dregs, and they are the lower class. They are like children of uh, German soldiers with French women and Vietnamese women with uh, American soldiers, kids that nobody wants or likes or you know wants to be associated with. And they become a, a very pivotal part of the story in the, uh, in the, in the sequels. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's really an exciting project, determined to get it off the ground and on the screens. Well, I couldn't be more excited to hear that, and, and I can't wait to see it. And I know I do know you got to go. Thanks for staying a little extra over. You're welcome. I can't thank you enough. There's, I have a million more questions, but another time. I'll be happy to do it again another time, particularly if we can uh, get these uh, pictures up and rolling. Uh, you'll have to come to the set and hang out, and uh, and then we'll certainly come back and visit here some more. That would be fun for me too, Jeff. That would be amazing. Thank you, Kenny, so much. I can't. I'm trying to get over the fact that I'm talking to you, but thank you so much. <laughs> it's my it's it's my total delight. I really appreciate it, Jeff. It's people like you that have kept this project alive, as well as said so many kind things about my other work over the years. I am deeply, deeply appreciate, appreciative of that. And it's why I really try to answer personally all of the gazillions of emails that I do get from people around the world, because I, it's given me such a great connection to my audience to be able to be directly in contact with them. And uh, certainly visiting the cons are, are terrific. Mark and I were down in uh, uh, in San Diego last in 19, July of 19, to announce the Blu-ray edition of the... and. You're, you walk into this airplane hangar where there's 4,000 people standing on chairs because they like your stuff. <laughs> you know, that's it's so exciting. And to be able to be one on one with them and uh, and keep my focus on what it is that they expect from us as the pre creators, producer and director of, of the movie versions. That really keeps us keeps our focus straight ahead. Amazing. I'm looking forward to a million more amazing things from you. And thank you again so much. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. Oh, how cool was that? I hope you all enjoyed that conversation I had with Kenny Johnson. Don't forget to check out his book, V the Second Generation, and cross your fingers with me. I hope those movie projects get off the ground. Can't wait to see those. Would love to see those. You know what else I'd love? I'd love to see you every Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern when I go live with Crossing the Streams with a bunch of buddies of mine every week. We talk about great TV shows that you should be streaming. I guess I'll let one cat out of the bag. You should be streaming V the miniseries on Amazon Prime. Check that out. But definitely come visit us. It's a live show. We engage with the audience. And it's Wednesdays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. You can find us on YouTube at the Jeff DeWaskin Show channel. You can follow us on Facebook where we go live there, facebook.com slash Jeff is funny. You can catch the replay at my website, Jeff is funny dot com or on IGTV or Facebook if you miss it live. All right, we're nearing the end of the show. So you know what that means. It's time for the hashtag trend of the week. That's right. This is the time where we read tweets from tweeters who played fun, engaging games on hashtag Roundup with hopes that one day their tweets would be read live on live from Detroit, the Jeff DeWaskin show. This week's hashtag, hashtag the reason Bigfoot is hiding. That's right. 
in honor of Kenny creating the iconic Bigfoot character on the $6 million man. We're going deep into hashtag the reason Bigfoot is hiding. This was originally brought to us by Hastro Tags, a weekly game on hashtag roundup. And here we go. Here are some compelling reasons why Bigfoot is probably hiding. To protect his beer supply, or more likely so his ex-wife can't claim child support from him, That's definitely a possibility. Or this one. He was a real chunky teenager and was tired of being mocked, so he went into hiding until he gets buff. The only trouble is he's lazy and loves fast food so much he's still fat. But one day, you'll all see he'll be buff. Then they'll all be sorry. That sounds like a pretty reasonable reason that Bigfoot would be hiding. Oh, here's another one. He owes the Loch Ness Monster a tree pity. Oh, this one might be uh, on point. The hype is too much. His feet are average at best. Oh, no. You know what they say about average feet. Oh, this one is probably very likely. Uh, Hashtag the reason Bigfoot is hiding. His wife's parents are in town. Who wouldn't go hiding after that? Here's another reason he might be hiding. He told his wife to calm down. Oh, never do that, folks. And finally, hashtag the reason Bigfoot is hiding. He's competing with Waldo for the World Hide and Seek Championships. Whoa, there we go. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, hashtag the reason Bigfoot is hiding. Another fun game from hashtag Roundup. As always, all the tweeters will be retweeted at Jeff Dwoskin Show on Twitter and will be listed in the show notes. Go retweet them. Show them some love. Also, grab the hashtag Roundup app from the Android or iTunes app stores. Totally free. Play along, and one day one of your tweets may end up on an episode of Live from Detroit, the Jeff Duoskin Show. Fame and fortune await you. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I can't believe it. We're at the end of yet another episode. Episode 41 has come and gone. Thank you so much to Kenny Johnson. Thank you all for coming back week after week after week. I can't thank you enough. Thanks for subscribing, liking, telling all your friends, and I'll see you next week. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Jeff Dwoskin Show with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Now go repeat everything you heard and sound like a genius. Catch us online at thejeffdwoskinshow.com or follow us on Twitter at Jeff Dwoskin Show. And we'll see you next time.